Hello everyone, welcome to my channel and my very messy studio. My name is Mark, and in this video, we're going to talk about how to draw trees using pen and ink in combination with monochrome wash, and pen and ink in combination with watercolor. I'm going to show you a few different approaches, give you a bunch of useful tips on working both in monochrome and full color, and as per usual along the way, show you a few old master examples. Let's get started, starting with pen and ink in combination with monochrome wash. I have a detailed tutorial on how to draw trees using only pen and ink, and some of the information here will overlap with that tutorial. That said, there are some significant differences between working only in line and using it in combination with wash. And the biggest difference is that pen and ink by itself is like a musical performance with a solo instrument, whereas pen and ink combined with wash is more like a duet. And in a duet, each instrument plays a specific part a part that must be predetermined beforehand, lest the instruments step all over each other. And as I see it, there are two ways to orchestrate a pen and ink and wash drawing. One where the ink is primary, with the wash playing a supporting role, and the reverse, where the wash has the primary role and the ink plays a supporting role. Here's an example of the first approach by the French Baroque master of landscape, Claude Lorraine, where the dominance of the pen gives the drawing a very strong graphic quality. And here's an example also by Lorraine, where the wash is dominant, giving the drawing an atmospheric softness strengthened with soft, almost stipple-like accents of pen and ink. Both approaches, of course, are equally valid, giving the drawing a different effect, the way a piece of music can be full of sharp staccato or soft and flowing. What you should avoid, however, is making the pen and ink and washes equally strong. There are exceptions, of course, but generally speaking, when this happens, the effect can be very messy. Here's an example, again by Lorraine, where both pen and ink are equally strong, which I think you'll agree is a bit chaotic. In this drawing, both the pen and ink and the wash are competing against each other to depict texture, detail, and value, which gives the drawing an unpleasant inconsistency of rendering, busyness, and splotchiness. But if you like this way of working and do want something that's somewhat busy and chaotic, who am I to tell you not to do it? Let's do the demo of the first approach, and as I ink, I'm going to go over some of the principles I follow when doing line work. On a technical note, for those interested in the materials I'm using, I'm working with a wonderful Pilot Custom 912 FA, a fountain pen with a very flexible nib that allows me to vary my line thickness. I'm working on a relatively smooth multimedia paper in my Talens Art Creation Sketchbook. One thing I find is that when working with pen in combination with washes, a pen with a wider stroke is preferable to something that is very fine. Unless your washes are very light in value, they will have a tendency to obscure your line work, so you want a pen with a thicker line weight to make sure this doesn't happen. So while for pen and ink only, I prefer extra fine nibs, for ink and wash, I will switch to something closer to medium. As for ink, I'm using the lovely Noodler's Gray, a highly transparent dark gray ink that is also very waterproof. Why gray and not black? I find that a slightly lighter value gives the drawing a warmer, softer feel, something I enjoy in a landscape drawing. The first thing to consider when putting in your lines is the simple principle that thin lines look further away and the thick lines look closer. This principle can be used to give your trees a stronger sense of volume. So for instance, if I was going to depict a bundle of leaves, I would make my lines thinner at the edges where the bundle is further away from me, and thicker where the bundles of leaves are closer to me. To illustrate this example, here are two examples of trees. The tree on the right follows this principle. The tree on the left does not. Can you tell that the tree on the left looks flatter, whereas the tree on the right is more three-dimensional? One easy way to apply this principle is to simply use pens of different widths to put in your lines, with fine pens used at the edges and the tops of the tree, and wider gauges used toward the center of the tree. Since I'm using a pen with a flexible nib, this allows me to vary the line weight. I'm also employing an additional bit of trickery, something called reverse writing. This is when you hold the pen with the feed facing up, which on many pens will result in a finer line. I'm going to use reverse writing on parts of the tree that are very far away, like the very top and the distant right and left edges, and then as I work inward and toward the bottom, do my best to increase the line weight. The second principle is to show complex overlapping shapes by keeping the contour open. So for example, if we have two overlapping shapes, instead of connecting their contours, if we allow the contour of the shapes that are further away to fade out where they're being overlapped, it'll give us a stronger sense of depth. Here's an example of two trees, 
one where the contours are fully closed on the left, and one with an open contour on the right. Can you tell the tree on the right looks more three-dimensional? The last two principles, at least the last I'm going to share in this tutorial, are to look at the general pattern of the leaves, which in most cases tend to grow upward at the top of a leaf bundle, and more and more horizontal at the sides, and at increasingly downward angles at the bottom, and also to keep the leaf textures random enough to look organic. Watch out for repeating patterns, leaves that are all the same size, and grow the same direction. Okay, I'm finished with the inking here, and I'm ready to go in with the wash. In this approach, the ink, again, is dominant and the wash plays a secondary role. We're going to keep it light and soft here, using it only to establish overall value and to reinforce the overarching shape. The value transitions have to be soft here and should contrast with the sharp graphic nature of the pen work. You can perhaps use the wash to indicate some leaf highlights, but do not go overboard as you risk making things too busy. The key thing to remember is that the wash does what the pen doesn't, and the pen does what the wash doesn't. Do not use washes to indicate texture, that's what the pen is for. Also, keep even the darkest part of the washes light enough so that the pen work stands out and is nice and clear. I'm using a water brush here and lifting ink directly from the nib. This is a lovely portable method of working, great for quick sketches where you don't need a tremendous amount of control. If I was doing a longer, more finished drawing, I would switch to using a palette and regular brushes. That said, with practice, you can get a sense of how much ink is being drawn from the pen and learn to control the wash with some accuracy. I should note that this only works with pens with generous ink flow, such as this Pilot Custom 912 FA. For example, when I tried this using a Pilot Falcon, I found that I couldn't draw enough ink from the nib and all of my washes were too light. Once I have filled the entire shape of the tree with a gray wash, the next step is to go into that wash while it's still wet and give the tree an overall shape by adding large shadows. In this case, there's a gentle light coming from the right, creating shadow areas on the left side of the tree. The overall shadows tend to be darker towards the center of the tree where the ambient lights of the sky can't reach. While well, I can wait for these initial washes to dry before doing this, you'll get softer results if you go in while the first wash is still wet. This short period of time, when the wash is still wet, is sometimes called the open time. Called so because it's the time when a wash can be adjusted, sopped up to go lighter, or gone into to go darker. Using the open time to create all kinds of effects takes a bit of practice, since you do have to move fast. But once you get used to it, it's a faster and often more effective method for layering values. If you need extra help with the basics of wash technique, I do have a handy tutorial for you that covers this information. Look for a link to this video in the description section below. Once the initial washes are dry, the next step is to define the smaller shapes in the tree. Once again, remember that the wash only does what the pen doesn't, so resist the urge to go into detail and texture. If, after putting in the wash, you feel like additional detail is needed, you can always go back in with a pen. Here is the finished example of the first approach. Again, heavy on the ink, light on the wash. This is one of my favorite ways of working, and was really popular with the masters. I really like the contrast between the sharp textures of the ink and the softness of the wash, and the way it allows you to be quite bold with the ink work and with the washes still have a careful and subtle control of value. Now let's try the second approach. In this case, since this way of working relies more heavily on wash, it might be best to start with it first. You can, of course, start with a pen, but it's harder to anticipate how much line work to put in when working this way. The order in which you do things in a drawing can play a large part in the final result, and I have an entire video comparing these two approaches. There are lots of purely technical reasons to choose one over the other. For example, if you're working with paper that buckles heavily, start with a pen. If you're using non-waterproof ink, then start with wash first. Ultimately, it's really a question of style. Drawings that are inked first tend to be more strongly graphic, since you're essentially coloring in an ink drawing, whereas if you put in your washes first, the pen is used more as an accent to emphasize textures and outlines rather than define everything. I recommend trying both ways of working to see what works best for you. For this drawing, I've decided to bring it to almost the state of completion using the wash, everything but the very last details such as the strongest textures and a few outlines here and there. Whatever ink work I do is mostly accent to give the drawing a touch of extra energy and strength. 
And here is the pen and ink stage. As you can see, the pen is being used sparingly, the idea being, to reiterate, that the ink does what the wash does not, and the wash does what the ink does not. Otherwise, the mediums will clash, and you risk having a mess on your hands. I'm trying to be less linear here, and instead of putting down strong leaf textures, use a little bit more of a broken, stippled line that represents areas of shadow and a few sharp edges. In effect, the pen becomes a very sharp brush here, and actually, I will sometimes use a brush or a brush pen when working in this style. By the way, you don't always have to stick with one approach when doing a drawing, and can combine the two. A good way of doing so is to use the ink heavy method in the foreground elements where you want things to look closer, and then use the wash heavy approach in elements that are further away where you need things to look softer. Here's an example of Claude Lorraine doing exactly this. So far, we've tackled how to deal with pen and ink and monochrome wash. Now let's go over how to do trees and pen and ink and watercolor. I'm going to start my demo, and as I work, I'll lay out the principles that I follow when adding watercolor wash to my line work. I'm going to follow the first approach here, which if you remember, relies heavily on the line work and keeps the washes relatively simple. So far, we've tackled how to deal with pen and ink and monochrome wash. Now let's go over how to do trees in pen and ink and watercolor. I'm going to start my demo, and as I work, I'll lay out the principles that I follow when adding watercolor wash to my line work. I'm going to follow the first approach here, which if you remember, relies heavily on the line work and keeps the washes relatively simple. I'm assuming that you already are somewhat familiar with using watercolor, know how to control it, and how to mix the colors. For those of you that are just starting out with this fascinating but often frustrating medium, I recommend watching my tutorials on color mixing, the links to which I'll leave below in the description section. I have my tree inked, I have my little toy palette and my water brush next to me, and I'm off to the races. Let's talk about the rules. The first principle is to mix your greens out of yellow and blue, as opposed to using actual green pigment. While there are some beautiful green pigments out there, in general, mixing your greens out of yellows and blues will give you softer and more complex mixtures. Many green pigments are very strong just by themselves, and also, there's a tendency to overuse them, making all the greens in your drawing look the same. Mixing your greens out of blue and yellow will make you think about the color in a more complex way, resulting in a more complex work of art. Here are two side-by-side -side examples of this principle. In this one, I'm using a single color, Hooker's Green, to make the mixture. As you can see, the color is very uniform and lacks nuance and subtlety. In the example on the right, I'm mixing my greens using Ultramarine Blue and Cadmium Yellow. Even though the mixture is still very simple, you can see the resulting color is much more varied and more interesting. I use a number of combinations of blues and yellows to make my greens, depending on the size of my palette. Besides ultramarine, blue, and cadmium yellow, I also use yellow ochre and Indian yellow for my yellows, and Prussian blue and cobalt blue for my blues. This is not to say that I avoid using green pigments altogether. Not at all. In fact, in my larger sets, I have several green pigments. Sap green, hooker's green, cadmium green, and even, sometimes, the dangerously strong phthalo green. But I think of them as spices rather than the meat and the potatoes. Meaning that I use green as strengtheners, adding them to my blue and yellow mixtures when I need something just a touch more saturated. The next principle is not to overmix your colors, making the mixtures very uniform. The slight unevenness that comes with only partially mixing your color does an effective job imitating the gentle shifts of color you see in nature. Man-made colors are uniform in nature, whereas natural color is always shifting and changing, and the brilliance of watercolor, what makes it uniquely suitable for landscape, is that this complexity of color can be achieved through the happy accidents that occur when you don't fully mix your colors. Here are examples illustrating this important principle. The bundle of leaves on the left is made with a mixture that is fully homogenized. Even though the multiple pigments in this mix contribute to making this color more complex, it's still too even, especially for an organic object. The second example, where I don't fully blend the pigments together, is much more varied, with some parts showing more yellow and other parts showing more blue, again, imitating the way colors shift in nature in all kinds of interesting ways. If your green mix is too saturated, the obvious way of desaturating it is by adding red. Adding a bright red, such as cadmium red, will create a harsh, muddy color, so I avoid it, and use softer reds instead, usually red oxide, sometimes called Venetian red, or an orangey brown called burnt sienna. When a less warm color is needed, I will usually add alizarin crimson. 
This purplish red, because of its closer location to blue on the color wheel, is great for creating cooler colors, and is very useful for mixing greens that are supposed to be in the distance. For shadows, the main principle is to avoid simply using a darker version of whatever color you're using in the light. This is a common mistake which makes the color in the shadows look too saturated and creates a monotonously uniform color scheme. The color in the shadows should not only be darker, it should also be more blue and less saturated. Why more blue? Because colors in the shadows are strongly influenced by the blue ambient light of the sky. Why less saturated? Because we need bright light to see strong saturation, which the shadows by definition do not have, making even a very bright color in the shadow appear more gray. This cooling and desaturation can be achieved by adding purple into your green mixtures. My favorite mixture here is ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. The advantage of these two colors is that they're dark, so they will automatically darken your color mixture. Here is yet another example illustrating this principle. In the bundle on the left, I'm adding the same color I used in the light to make the shadows. Can you see that something isn't right? Not only is the color too saturated, there's also a lack of color variety. Sometimes if the color in the shadow is very strong, it reaches something called the point of incandescence. This is where a color becomes so intensely saturated that it looks like it's glowing. While this can occur in the lights as well, this is a common mistake made by beginners, especially if they simply use a darker version of whatever they used in the light to make the shadow. The bundle on the left started with the same color, but to make the shadow this time, I added alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue to my original green mixture. Can you see that it makes for a more effective shadow color? Another piece of advice is to restrain yourself from making shadows too dark for a number of reasons. First of all, we're outside in an environment that, even if it's overcast and gloomy, is flooded with sunlight. This will prevent shadows from going overly dark. The second reason for doing this is that we're using watercolor in combination with pen and ink, and in order for the pen and ink to show through clearly, we should avoid obscuring it with very dark washes. And last, and to my mind, most important principle is to vary the color. This, of course, applies to all part of your painting, but is particularly important to think about in the shadows, where beginners tend to oversimplify the color. Keep in mind that just like in the lights, there is as much color complexity in the shadows. Never mix up a single color for the shadows and use it everywhere. Keep the color moving, always. Colors in nature are constantly shifting, changing value, hue, and saturation, and the more attuned an artist is to those very subtle shifts, the more visual interest can be added to the work. Keep looking, keep mixing, keep changing the color, and I promise you, you'll make a better work of art. The very last thing I'm going to do with this drawing is to go back into it with a little bit more ink. The difficulty of working in two different mediums in a single drawing is anticipating how much of each you're going to need. The ink stage was done without the benefit of seeing the watercolor wash, which has a softening effect on the line work. Though I was trying to make the line work bold, I was tricked into thinking it was bold enough by the white of the paper. Now that I've seen the washes put down, I can easily see that I need to do much more line work. The lesson here is to not be afraid to go back and forth between ink and wash, calibrating both so that they have just the right balance with each other. I hope you found this tutorial on pen and ink and wash useful, and if you did and haven't subscribed yet, please do so and stay tuned to many others like it. Also, feel free to suggest ideas for future tutorials. Thank you so much for watching, and see you back here in my very messy studio soon. Bye for now.